I wrote quarterly letters to my clients, so I assembled things on my desk. They would accumulate, and I eventually had something like a thick telephone book of just the things that I knew and had documented that did not conform with the accepted narrative that people were being shown through the media. I was expecting that there were going to be large-scale insolvencies after the housing bubble. I was aware of what happened during the housing bubble and how that was engineered. So what was happening was tremendous growth in the derivatives complex. So I started becoming concerned about derivatives in the very early 2000s, in the aftermath of the dot-com bubble. At that time, the derivatives complex was about twice global GDP. By 2007, it was 10 times global GDP. That growth in maybe five or six years. So the financialization was outstripping any real thing on earth already. The Fed has murky powers that people don't know about until they decide to make it visible. One of their powers is to create entities out of nothing. You just create a limited liability company and then the Fed can loan money, create money and put it into that entity it's completely off balance sheet. It doesn't have to be disclosed anywhere. But in this case, they did. They created something called Maiden Lane, which is a street I sometimes walk down in the Southern District of Manhattan and the Financial District. So Maiden Lane was extended this created money to buy these problematic positions out of the banks, take them off the hands of the banks. And there was so much of this problematic stuff that they then created a Maiden Lane 2 and a Maiden Lane 3. And who knows what else was created that we were not told about. So in 2008, I noticed the first failure of a broker dealer. So I was expecting there to be a lot of insolvencies. I was paying attention. And the thing that shocked me was that the client accounts in this broker dealer were encumbered in the bankruptcy estate of the broker that never could have happened before. In all of the history of securities, they were personal property. And if the broker failed, you would say, I'm sorry, you're out of business. Here's where you can transfer my assets. That did not happen in this case. So I started digging into what could possibly have changed. And this was as serious as a heart attack given that we were going into this meltdown at that time. That's when I discovered it had been done through changes to the Uniform Commercial Code in the United States. This had been done in all 50 states. So it was something that could be done very quietly over a long period of time and did not have to be done at the federal level, didn't draw attention. What they did was to create a new legal construct of a security entitlement. Now prior to this, as I said, securities for 400 years were personal property. This concept of a security entitlement severed that. That's its purpose. So what people then have in institutions and uh, pension funds, even sophisticated investors, all they have is an entitlement. It's a claim. It's a contractual claim, which is very weak in the event of insolvency. So it's an appearance of ownership. It's sometimes referred to as beneficial ownership, which sounds nice, but what it means is that you receive dividends, you receive a proxy, you are the owner of title, you can, of course, you can buy it and sell it, but you can see in documents that I've found that the legal owner is actually the entity that controls the security with a secured interest. They are the legal owners of the 
property. So now you have a contractual claim. Next, all of the securities are held in pooled form. So you have no specific identification. It used to be that with paper certificates, they were numbered. You had a specific numbered bond or stock share certificate. So now they're fungible fungible bulk, book entry form, pooled. Further, we know, and it is absolutely irrefutable from the Fed's own response to a questionnaire from the EU, that even segregated accounts, even people or institutions that have been told that their securities are segregated, are in the same pool and entitled to only a pro rata share in the event of an insolvency of the custodian. So again, segregation is just an appearance. People are told that it's an absolute subterfuge. And the shocking thing is that even sophisticated institutional investors do not understand this or they don't want to know it. Further, even if fraud, outright fraud is committed by the custodian, that does not obviate the ability of the secured creditors to take the securities from these pools ahead of the people who thought they owned them. Then there was, in 2005, a change to the bankruptcy law in the United States creating something called safe harbor. Again, that sounds nice, but what safe harbor means is safe harbor for the secured creditors to take the client assets and to make that absolutely certain that even in the event of fraud, they will take the client assets. So prior to this change in bankruptcy law, there was something called fraudulent transfer, fraudulent conveyance. And the trustee, the bankruptcy trustee, had a duty to claw back any assets that had been fraudulently transferred. So this change was made in 2005. And then with the failure of Lehman Brothers, this was cemented in case law. And we can see the judgment by the bankruptcy court related to this. What happened there was that JP Morgan was both the custodian for the client assets and the secured creditor that took the client assets, which prior to 2005, everything that happened there would have been constructively fraudulent. But the bankruptcy judge, this is the Southern District of New York, which is Manhattan, found in favor of J.P. Morgan that J.P. Morgan absolutely was entitled to take the client assets. The only question was whether J.P. Morgan was an entitled person basically to take the client assets. This is an important point because it's not all secured creditors that have this power to take the client assets. It is only the very biggest banks that are entitled to take the client assets. So they don't want anyone else elbowing in there to take anything, only they will take them. And in this judgment, the judge asked the question, is JP Morgan a member of the protected class? Used explicitly those words and said quite obviously, as one of the biggest banks in the world, the biggest financial institutions, JP Morgan is quite obviously a member of the protected class. To see this in a bankruptcy case law from the court, I think that's pretty strong stuff. It's like that document directly from the Fed provided to the legal certainty group. This is hard to refute. A custodian has the records of who owns what. It's in their books and records, but that's all it is. It is the records. The system has been changed so that the property itself is then transferred up to a higher level and held in pooled form. So you deal with your broker to execute a trade to buy or sell something and you get a representation of an account that shows you what you have in it. 
but the assets are not held, even at what you think is your custodian. It's transferred to a higher level. In the U.S., that is the Depository Trust Corp, which holds all securities in the United States in pooled form. So the brokers themselves are low down in the food chain. In Europe, there are central security depositories at the national level that give an appearance of a registry of ownership at the national level. But by law, under something called the Central Security Depository Regulation, CSDR, which was imposed in 2014, by law, these securities are transferred by a mandatory link to an international Central Securities Depository. So they want cross-border mobility of the collateral to occur. So in Sweden, for example, you have a local registry, but then the securities go up to Euroclear Belgium. So they are subject to Belgian law, not Swedish law at that level. And then the collateral is transported to underpin the derivatives complex, which is housed at the central clearing counterparties. The acronym is the CCPs. So this is the purpose to take the collateral up to this uh, central clearing counterparty level. And we know from a BIS document that is now over 10 years old that the systems are in place for the movement of this collateral on a global basis nearly instantaneously, especially in a crisis, to be swept to meet the collateral demands of the system, the secured creditors, also associated with this, we have to understand derivatives used to be bilateral. You knew when you entered into a contract who your counterparty was, and you looked to the credit quality of that counterparty. They were on the other side. In the name of reducing risk, they actually increased risk. They created a monolithic risk because they forced central clearing so that the CCP is the counterparty. On all derivatives contracts, the central clearing parties are the counterparties. Now, what does that mean if the central clearing party itself fails? That means there is no counterparty there to honor the derivative contracts for all manner of things, but especially people that think that they have hedged their downside risk in the collapse. There's no counterparty. And the central clearing parties have been deliberately undercapitalized. So in Europe and the US, there are discussions by the participants themselves about the possibility of the central clearing parties failing. In the last few years, there have been discussions of this. And if you look at at DTC itself, which houses all the securities in the U.S. securities complex and is the central clearing party for most derivatives, they have discussion of how they will start over again when the central clearing party collapses and explicitly that they will not put more capital behind it but they have pre-funded the startup of a new central clearing party when one of the existing ones fails. So it's essentially planned and the entire capital base of depository trusts, so essentially the entire US securities complex is housed there in all derivatives. The entire capital is 3.5 billion dollars. Individual banks have derivative positions the size of the global GDP. So something will happen to trigger this collapse implosion. I would say the cake is already baked at this time. It's been made to happen because to take interest rates after having kept them at zero for 15 years, which was insane to begin with and did not have to happen, is made to happen. And then in essentially a year to take that back to over 5%. And if you're noticing, they're not stopping. 
the rates are continuing up. So the risk is in the derivatives complex. It doesn't disappear, it doesn't go away. It's all there. And this pain will accumulate in the central clearing counterparties, and then they will fail. And they're basically telling us they will fail. And when that happens, the people that thought that they had hedged their exposure included the most sophisticated institutions and the pension funds will have no protection. And the secured creditors will take all of the underlying stocks and bonds, which then gives them control of all public corporations. And once you control the capitalization structure, you then control all of the underlying real things. So this is something like what happened in the 1930s when there was distress globally everywhere due to debt levels. And you would think that there were no winners, but there were because the banks that were controlled by the Federal Reserve, for example, in the US, were slated to survive. 9,000 banks in the United States were forced into failure. The people who had money in those banks lost all their cash, but their debts were not canceled. Their debts were then consolidated into the Federal Reserve System and enforced. So people that were in debt were in trouble. Even wealthy people lost everything. The difference this time around is they're not going after just property that is encumbered by debt. They've engineered this so they can take things, all securities as collateral, from people and entities that have no borrowings against them. They own them clear and outright. Now, let me give you an example as an analogy to explain the horror of this. So you have bought a car and you paid cash for it. You think you're being very conservative. You have no debt against the car, but unbeknownst to you, the dealer continues to control your car as collateral. You're not told this. The dealer uses your car and all the other cars sold by the dealer as collateral for his borrowing in his business. Now, the dealer goes bust and only certain secured creditors are empowered to immediately take your car and all the cars ever sold by the dealer without any judicial review immediately. When I describe this to people, they get worried about their cars. This is not about your car. <laughs> this is an analogy for what has been done. It's much worse than this being about your car because it is literally about the entire securities complex globally. So it is not about your insolvency that causes the loss of your assets. It's the insolvency of the people that secretly used your collateral as their property without telling you that or disclosing it. I've always been interested in what happened in the 30s because of talking about these things with my father who lived through that and what I saw happening in Cleveland when I was a boy. I'd try to talk with anyone who had lived through that time. And I asked my aunt uh, what had happened in the 30s and she said, well, suddenly no one had any money. And I said, what do you mean? How could that be? And she said, well, no one had any money and even wealthy families didn't have any money. When you really look at what happened there, if you close all the banks, which is what FDR did, he suddenly literally closed all the banks and then only certain banks were allowed to reopen which were the ones controlled by the Fed, well, then suddenly no one had any money. So what do we have this time around? Gold is not the underlying collateral in this system. It's all securities globally. So they will be taken under the argument that, well, we have to save these systemically vital institutions so that we can restart the economy again. How could we restart the economy if they are not protected? So that will be the reason given. And it's like a game of Monopoly where all of the pieces, all of the money on the board, 
are pulled back to the bank and then they say, let's start a new game. And we'll start over from the basis that we have everything and you don't. So would you like to borrow something? And this is what the CBDC, the central bank digital currency will be. It will be very difficult for people to refuse to use it because they literally won't be able to eat. They will have an app they can download. This will be the help. This will be the cavalry riding to the rescue. Just download this app and you can load your phone with some currency to allow you to go buy milk. But every time you use that, you are actually borrowing money from them. They have you again. It will happen very fast. This will unfold in a very frightening crisis kind of environment and people will have difficulty refusing. And that's why it's so important to spread this awareness of this beforehand so that people understand what is happening and so that people can become engaged in this all the way to the top of the system. It has the potential to activate very capable people all the way to the top of the system. It has the potential to unify people against this. Actually, if the money is just cut off to these entities, it stops. I think that we're very close to this collapse being triggered. What are the indications for that? Well, most profoundly, what has been done to interest rates and where they are now and the scale of the insolvencies that are out there, they're not being discussed. They're being covered up. The only way that the financial system has not collapsed is that there is a big hidden hand injecting lots of created money directly into the financial markets, holding them up right now, as well as allowing institutions to believe they have downside risk by buying protection in the derivatives market, the combination of those things. So this support, the hidden hand as I call it, can be withdrawn at the time of their choosing. But we're getting late in this process given what's already happened to the interest rates. The other indication of timing is the bank resolution, the documents of the Bank Resolution Authority in Europe. Their planning cycle documents were mandating all of the globally systemically important banks to be ready for solvent wind down at the end of last year, 2022. Now, what they mean by solvent wind down is not wind down of the entire bank <laughs> on a solvent basis. It will be parts of the bank that will remain solvent, but they've literally mandated that they have to be ready, the biggest banks, to go flat on all of their derivatives positions in a controlled way, suddenly. So they've prepared for that. That is operational as of the end of last year. Now, in this year's planning cycle document, they are saying that they are on track to have completed all their work by the end of this year, 2023. So these are indications to give you another idea of the seriousness of this. They've been running these trilateral exercises with Britain and the EU and the US for six of the seven past years. I think they may have missed a year during COVID, but in these exercises, from the U.S. side, the participants are the U.S. Treasury Secretary, the Chairman of the Federal Reserve, the Chairman of the FDIC, the heads of all these entities in this exercise, which I've never seen before with anything. So they're very, very serious about this. And these exercises are about assuring the cross-border transfer of the collateral when the banks are put into wind down. The book I've written is called The Great Taking, and you can find it on a landing page at the Great 
www.thetaking.com. There is a free PDF you can download. I've done it this way because it will make it close to zero friction so it can spread globally and that is really happening. Some people would say, well, surely you must be paid something for this. And I know that if I had been paid anything, I would just use it to spread the book. So why do that? Make it zero friction. This is the most important thing I can do right now. There are hard copy books you can get through Lulu and those cost something because it costs something to produce them and they can be delivered globally. There is some small profit in that but I am directing that to another person who is a scientist and has done very important work.